My name is Nick Wright. I'm uh, an engineer at Newcastle University. And I'm going to come to talk to you today really about zero emission flight. Now, obviously, when we talk about zero emission flight, we're talking about it in the context of climate change. That's the reason why we're interested in it. Now, but interestingly, when you think about the kind of discussions or what we see mostly in the media in terms of positivity about climate change, we hear about offshore wind, we hear about electric cars. For some reason, we never really hear much about positive options for flight. We just hear about the problem. And what I'm here to talk to you today is actually about the positive side, actually, about how that we can find solutions that will help us, actually, to avoid the problem with the current situation with, with aeroplanes. But I'm going to start my talk in a perhaps a slightly un unexpected place. Uh, what you can see behind you is a picture of New York. It's ground zero after the 9-11 attacks. And actually what you can see here is the memorial, the light memorial that was made to uh, commemorate the event and to um, you know, to, to remember the victims and the suffering of 9-11. And 9-11 was obviously truly a terrible thing. But it did create a rather unexpected consequence, which we can use, actually, to think positively about the question of aeroplanes. Now, normally, when we try to think about, you know, we've, Herb has mentioned already, we're all sort of aware that flying is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for the environment. But the question of how exactly how bad it is is actually quite hard to actually measure. Because if you think about it, in general, what we would have to do is go compare a situation in the distant past where there were no aeroplanes with the current situation where we have lots of aeroplanes flying. And unfortunately, lots of other things have changed in that time period. So it's really difficult to actually quantify exactly the effect on the climate of, of flying. Except that after 9-11, the US authorities closed US airspace for three complete days. This is a completely unique circumstance that has really never happened before. And so in that three-day period, there were virtually no planes flying anywhere across the whole of the continental US. A completely unique circumstances. And what climate scientists noticed was that the climate of the US was affected just during that three-day period. In that three-day period, the difference between the night and the day temperature changed by two degrees in just three days. Now, lots of the discussion about in COP27 is going to be about protecting the climate from a change of 1.5 degrees. And yet here we have an effect where we change the temperature of the whole of the US by two degrees in three days. So I would say it's pretty clear that flying has a major impact on the climate. And therefore, we need to stop procrastinating and doing something about it. We need to figure out positive solutions to do something about this effect. And that's really what I'm, just, I'm going to talk to you about uh, now. So why does flying have such a big effect? Well, the first thing is actually that it emits carbon. We're burning a fuel. And that carbon emission is very powerful. The other problem is that we emit the carbon in the high altitude rather than on the ground. So it interacts much more directly with the atmosphere. Actually, it's believed that the effect of the carbon emissions is twice as high at high altitude than it is on the ground. But there are also other effects as well. The picture you can see here, it's those fluffy white clouds that we all like. We all love to see these in the sky as the plane flies overhead. They're called contrails. The contrails are emitted directly from the jet engine. They look cute from a distance, but actually when you look close up, they're just another form of pollution. What happens here is that the engine emits both water vapor and soot. And that soot they combine to produce these contrails. And it's these contrails, actually, that are behind the 9-11 effect, or at least believed to be. They act as a sort of seed for the formation of high-altitude uh, clouds. And it's those clouds which, which blanket the Earth and prevent the heat escaping during the night. 
So these contrails, although they look cute, are actually a major issue for the climate uh, and directly, of course, caused by planes. Now, when we think about making transport more sustainable, we generally, our immediate solution, our standard playbook, is to electrify it. So we have electric trains. We've had those for many generations, in fact. Some people here today will have come in electric cars. We're all familiar with electric cars. And electric ships also exist. So the question is, why not electric planes? Why not use the same solution to see what we can do to improve electric planes? The problem, though, is that planes need to be both powerful and light. And the power levels are quite considerable. A passenger jet, if it was converted to electricity, would need to use megawatts of electrical power. So one passenger jet would need the electri electricity of a small town like Morpeth. So the power levels are very, very high. And that's one of the problems that stopped progress up to date. However, there are electric planes that do already exist. This picture that you can see behind me, it's not a simulation. It's not a computer-generated image. This is a real electric plane. It's actually made by an English company called Vertical Aerospace, and it's, it's called a VX4. And this VX4 is powered from batteries. And what you can see are electric motors which drive the propellers. It's actually a bit like a giant drone. The propellers are vertical at takeoff, but as the plane rises, the propellers move across into the horizontal position and the plane will travel forward. It's called a tilt rotor. And this is a real plane. They've actually already got a license to fly this plane. They're doing test flights at the moment. I think there was one only a couple of days ago. And those test flights are going very well. And it's believed that this plane will be fully certified to fly in UK airspace in less than three years. So this is real progress towards electric flight. The problem with this design, though, is that it's battery powered. And batteries are quite heavy. And you can only store a certain amount of energy inside a normal battery. So the range of the VX4 is limited to, say, around 150 miles for five people. It's often described as an air taxi. So if you imagine, for example, you want to travel between Newcastle and, say, Manchester Airport. At the moment, you have to endure a three-hour train drive. If you're lucky, the train will turn up and you'll get there. But it's three hours. This VX4 will take you from Newcastle to Manchester Airport in less than one hour. And it's completely silent. So it can land on the roof of a car park or in a park or a field or anywhere in the city. And it's widely believed that within a few years, we will see these kind of air taxis moving around our cities. So this is real progress towards electric flight. The problem is it's limited in range. The batteries are quite heavy. And if we want to fly further, then we have to have a different solution. So up on the screen here, this is pictures of one of my favorite places. In fact, it's really my favorite place outside of Newcastle is Lisbon. It's a common destination south of the Mediterranean. That's about 1,600 miles for us from here in Newcastle. Batteries are limited in the power that they can create and the density of energy that they can store. So even with the most outrageous improvements in battery technology, we're never going to get to our holiday flights using a technology like the uh, VX4. It's always going to be limited in range. It's an air taxi. It's not going to travel long distances. So we're going to need a different solution for our flights, for our holidays, and of course, for long distance intercontinental flight. So what could we do for long distance flight? Well, some people actually propose something different. They say, let's put that standard playbook about electrification to the side, and let's just use conventional planes but let's just change the fuel. So we could change the fuel from, it's, the fuel in a normal plane in the moment is called kerosene. It's a bit like petrol, a special kind of petrol. It's made from oil. They propose that we replace that kerosene with a biofuel. That's a fuel that's derived purely from plants. 
Now, theoretically, that is zero carbon. You have to grow the plants, you convert it into fuel, and the whole cycle comes around. So it is a theoretically, in the long run, a zero carbon solution. The problem is, actually, when you dig a bit deeper, as you can see in this report here, what you find is that most of these biofuels are actually um, derived from forests. There's large areas of forests in countries like Canada being cut down every day to create biofuels for the European market. So, in my opinion, biofuels are not really a, a way to go. They're described as sustainable air fuel. But is it really, really, truly sustainable in the long run? The other problem is, is that you're still burning a hydrocarbon. And you're still burning that hydrocarbon in the high atmosphere. You're still creating contrails. So you're still going to have those effects. So I don't think this solution is good enough. We need a better solution than just changing the fuel. So this is the sort of technology that I'm proposing and a lot of other people are proposing as well. I do accept that we need a fuel. Batteries just can't store enough energy per kilo to give us long-range flight. And battery flight is also quite slow. The air taxi can only go at around about 150 miles an hour. That sounds a lot compared to a car, but it's about one-third of the speed of a normal plane. So a flight to Lisbon would, in an air taxi would take about nine hours, and that's obviously not going to work. So we need something that's capable of long-distance flight, but is also quicker as well. So we're going to need a fuel. But instead of burning a fuel, we could use a fuel like hydrogen, and we could feed that into a device called a fuel cell. And a fuel cell, as I'll try and explain in a second, is a bit like a kind of fancy battery. It takes in the hydrogen, and it generates electricity, and we can use that electricity to power motors and generate the thrust we need for the plane. And this is what I'm showing here on this screen. This is a project that I work on at the university. It's called H2 Gear. And this is the H2 gear plane. Unlike the VX4, it looks like a normal plane. From the outside, it, you wouldn't know the difference. But at the back of the plane, up here, we'll have fuel cells, we'll have electric technology, which is in fact the, the specific part that I work on. This is our electric technology for the plane. And that will power electric motors to make the plane take off. So this is a completely electric technology, but it uses a fuel, and the plane can therefore travel much faster uh, than a, the VX4 battery-driven example. So just to give you an illustration a little bit more about how this technology works, on the left-hand side up here, I've got a fuel cell. This is really the magic inside the H2 gear plane. This is the real thing that generates the electricity from the hydrogen. And what happens is we feed in the hydrogen, we feed in oxygen from the air, and it generates electricity. And the only byproduct is pure water. Not dirty water, pure, clean water. So clean that you can drink it. So the fuel cell is a completely non-polluting way to generate electricity. And then we can feed that into our electric motors to generate the thrust for the plane. Now, when I describe this to people, usually the first question they ask to me is, OK, that sounds very clever, but where do you get the hydrogen from? And in fact, it's actually not so difficult to generate hydrogen. There's a process which has been understood for many years. It's called electrolysis. And it's used every day in, in many industries to generate uh, hydrogen. And this is a machine here that does exactly that. This machine takes in energy, it takes in electricity, but that could be renewable energy from offshore wind farms or for any other renewable method. It takes in as input only pure water. And then the electricity is used to split the atoms of the water apart to generate the hydrogen and oxygen that you would need for the fuel cell. So this is a completely sustainable process that need involve no burning, no combustion, and no hydrocarbons of any kind. Completely 100% renewable. 
And these technologies have existed for many, many years. You can buy them very readily for use in this kind of technology. So the big question really is, how do we make all of this happen? As an engineer, having seen the details of all of this, it's quite clear to me that 100% sustainable electric flight is completely possible. We have all the technologies that we need. It's not necessary to power planes by hydrocarbons, causing all the damage that they do. We need to do just like we've done with electric cars and build electric planes that will actually remove all of the source of all of these pollutions. The thing that we need, though, is that we need pressure. We need pressure from people to make this happen. The only reason that car companies are building electric cars is because there are regulations that force them to do it. We need regulations to make airlines fly electric planes. Now, as an engineer, I think this is a completely feasible prospect. But what I'd really like to see is COP27 insist that we move to electric flight, produce regulations that will force airlines to actually do this. Because otherwise, I think they will procrastinate. <laughs> Thank you very much.